Dave Cahill. Dave Cahill, Dick Sears, and Good Senate morning. Judiciary. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And uh, we uh, look forward to hearing from you in a few minutes, but Eric is going to walk us through the bill as presented. I know that a number of people have <coughs> suggested changes, um, including yourself, and which is normal. But we did introduce a bill that we, um, the members of the Justice Oversight Committee heard a great deal of testimony about the situation in White River Junction and obviously the situation in Chittenden County where charges were dropped and then the Attorney General's office took them over. So um, I think we all agree there's a problem. Uh, it's the solution that um, is part of the difficulty. So hopefully we can come up with something that will that will work, that's fair to all sides. So, uh, Eric, do you want to? Yeah. Walk through the bill to start with. Yeah. yeah. And David, thank you for being, are you still at the state's attorney's office or are you now in private? <laughs> I, I am, I, I'm in limbo. I'm in my office in White River Dunstan doing my job, but uh, my state email got cut off. So oh. <laughs> here we are on the phone. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I can't help you with state email. <laughs> I didn't know they did that. <laughs> All right, Eric, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Senator Sears. Uh, this is Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel, here to walk you through S-183, an act relating to competency to stand trial and insanity as a defense. Senator Sears, as you were mentioning earlier, this is a subject that the Justice Oversight Committee was looking at this summer and this fall, uh, just for a moment of where the genesis of the language in the bill came from. Uh, as Justice Oversight looked at the, at the issue, they asked uh, uh, Dave Cahill and James Pepper to make a proposal. Uh, the proposal came in from them. I did some rewriting, some restructuring, that sort of thing. Um, uh, but policy-wise, and the policy choices you see in the bill in front of you are, are the proposal, still the proposal that uh, uh, James and David made. So I'm going to certainly walk you through the language of the bill, help with any questions about what it does, but to the extent that you have questions about why a certain choice was made, why it was one policy over another, I think David and James will be better to answer those questions than I will. Um, another background point, just to keep in mind, I, I remember mentioning this to the committee when we were having our discussion about committee priorities. There's a United States Supreme Court case uh, that's pending. It was actually the first case that was argued this term, in the first Monday in October, that has to do with the constitutionality of an insanity, uh, or actually of Kansas's approach to actually repeal the insanity defense completely. So they don't have an insanity defense in Kansas, and there's a, a big picture constitutional question pending before the U.S. Supreme Court about whether that's constitutional at all. Now that isn't done in this bill, it doesn't you know, do the same thing, repeal the insanity defense completely, but to the extent that the court says uh, something in its opinion about how the state is or isn't free to regulate the insanity defense, it may be relevant to the bill you're looking at here, and I'll certainly keep an eye on that in case that it is. So with those two points as background, let's look at what is going on in S-183, a big picture for the moment. Uh, the, the general statutory approach to the insanity defense and the competency to stand trial is to set out the details of the procedure very carefully in statute. So the statutes are very explicit, they're very specific about what the, what the procedures are for a defendant raising the insanity defense, for how the um, procedure happens. And the big picture of what's going on in S-183 is it essentially makes a carve out to those procedures. It, it, there's an exception established in the bill to the general approach uh, to the procedures involving the insanity defense, and it specifically applies to only a particular type, uh, particular group of cases. And these are cases in which a defendant has been adjudicated not guilty by reason of insanity for either a homicide or an attempted homicide. So that's what's going on in the bill. That's the big picture nutshell. It takes uh, the general procedures that apply in these cases and in insanity defense cases and establishes a separate set of procedures that apply in a particular type of case. And those cases are, as I said, uh, when a defendant is acquitted, acquitted uh, by reason of insanity for homicide or attempted homicide. So the question that obviously comes up and which you need to look at the language to answer is, well, what are these different procedures? How is it different than what uh, ordinarily applies 
when someone raises the insanity defense. Um, so that starts over on page two of the bill, and we just want to pass out uh, the language really quick about the insanity defense itself. There's a few extra copies here, but I'll pass these around. This is the, this is the statute that's not in the bill, but uh, the existing insanity defense statute in Title 13. And it uh, lays out right there what the standard is um, for what a defendant has to prove uh, in order to establish the defense of insanity. So you see in A1 of the language I just passed out, that's the operative language that we're looking at here. Person is not responsible for criminal conduct if at the time of such conduct, as a result of mental disease or defect, and I should point out here that that's obviously archaic, outdated language that has been in the statutes for a long time. Uh, we're only using the terminology now because it's what it says in the statute and the case law has developed for many, many years around that, that phrase. That's why it's still what it is. Uh, because of that mental disease or defect, he or she lacks adequate capacity either to appreciate the criminality of his or her conduct or to conform his or her conduct to the requirements of the law. So you've got two pieces there. You've got a causation piece and an actual uh, uh, mental status piece. So you have to show two things. One, that the, that the defendant uh, couldn't understand the nature of their criminal, criminal nature of their conduct or conform their conduct to the requirements of the law. And as a result of that, uh, that happened as a result of their mental disease or de defect. In other words, there, there was a connection between the mental illness and the inability of the defendant to either uh, understand what that they were doing was illegal or to act legally. So that's the nature of the defense. Procedurally, as I was saying, um, the statutes lay out pretty specifically uh, what happens around a defendant making this, uh, making this defense. And over on page two, where I just uh, mentioned the word start, the existing, the existing language starts on line five. And the big picture point here is that when a person is found not guilty by reason of insanity, so in other words, they meet the standard that's on the language that I just passed out, and the defendant successfully makes that defense, the court has to hold a hearing to determine whether or not the defendant is to be committed to the custody of the Department of Mental Health. So there has to be this hearing in order to make that determination. And whether or not the person gets committed turns on whether or not uh, the person is found to be a danger to themselves or others, which is a standard I know that we've talked about a lot in this committee. It's familiar to everybody. The language is on line six, that existing language, five and six. The court finds that the person is a person in need of treatment or a patient in need of further treatment, and that's a legal term that essentially is defined to mean danger to yourself or to others. If the court makes that finding, then they have to be committed to DMH. Um, you see in line nine, for an indeterminate period is the language in the statute, uh, but what has been developed through case law and through the application of the statute is that the initial commitment order is for a period of 90 days, okay, generally speaking. That's an important point, because you're gonna see the first change to that general procedure is uh, is on that exact point. So let me go back to. I wanna. I think I know the answer to this question. But in the current statute, uh, two questions. One is in one. A one. At the time of such conduct. So it means at the time that the offense occurred, but not. It could be that the person is completely sane when they're, when they're, you know, when the episode is over. Yes, it, it, it totally turns on the defendant's mental state at the time of the offense. And the, exactly. and the defendant has the burden of proof to prove that they were insane at the time of the offense. So yes. it doesn't matter that they have schizophrenia or whatever else has been diagnosed. It's at the time of the offense. Correct. Whether or not they're competent to stand trial is a separate question. The insanity defense turns on the defendant's so ability at the time of the if, offense. If one was had a serious mental illness, they may be found to not be competent to stand trial. But if they had a jealous rage, could that be, um, you know, against a spouse that was leaving them or whatever? You know, think of the situations where. Sometimes people murder other people um, in a jealous rage, or, or would that be an insanity defense? Uh, the rage was over. It's, it's very once they completed the the act, their anger at that person 
Wouldn't that be second degree? Um, well, I think if I, that's typically manslaughter. Uh, if, if, if there's a if, if there's a sudden passion as a result of provocation, if there's no sudden passion as a result of provocation, then it's murder too. Okay. Can I ask uh, on the same question? If somebody is medicated and with their medication, they're they're judged um, to not have. A mental disease that would prevent this, but they were off their medication when they committed the crime. Um, is is that a viable use of this? So, in other words, somebody um, when they committed the crime, they were off their meds, and then they're brought into jail. They're medicated again, and can they can they avoid responsibility in that way? I believe that because the question turns on the mental state of the defendant at the time of the offense, that it is possible, regar regardless mm -hmm. of how it happened, that they, the defendant might not have been able to appreciate the criminality of his conduct or, mm -hmm. or act in accordance with the law for that reason. What I'm getting at is, and I should have asked it more clearly, a person is judged to be incompetent when they committed the act. Well, when they then, committed the act, the competency is not an issue. The competency has to do with standing trial. They could be insane when they committed the act. Well, they're insane when they committed the act, okay. but they're not insane today. Right. They are then released? Uh, they could be. That's when it, that's when it d turns on the exact uh, <coughs> phase that we were just talking about. It depends whether they are determined to be uh, a danger to themselves or others, whether they are uh, a person in need of treatment. If the court finds after this hearing that they're a danger to somebody else or to themselves, then they would be committed. But if, the, if they're not, then yes, they could be released. And since this language is so archaic, should we be changing that in this law too? That's something, yeah, that's entirely possible. Interesting point, uh, I think it was uh, 2013 when uh, that language was changed for a while. Um, within the context, remember, there was a big discussion at that time about whether a person with traumatic brain injury Right. Would fall under and how that person would be treated and by which department. Ultimately, there, there was a, a big debate around expense, actually. It was, it was going to be a, a, a costly endeavor. It was unclear which state department would handle treatment of TBI patients. It turned out to be Dale that was uh, placed into the statute, but um, there was a delayed effective date and it was eventually repealed because of discussion, I think, about money involved and whether TBI patients. Uh, could be treated. But at the time, temporarily, <coughs> yes, that language was changed to mental illness or developmental disability. Um, so you might want to, if you're going to make other changes, you certainly could uh, make that change anyway, as well. Can, Go ahead. can I just add? <clears throat> so first, first, somebody is um, found either competent or incompetent in stand trial. I mean, that would be, and if they are found competent to stand trial, then they could use the insanity uh, defense. Is is that is that right? I mean, well, I think the the uh, insanity defense is, goes to the first point of whether or not they had the the uh, mental state at the time of the offense, and then if they did, they could still argue that they were incompetent to stand trial. That at the time when the trial proceedings were to happen. That they couldn't either participate in their own defense or understand the nature of the charges against them. So when would, you, when would you do the? Well, never. I'll I'll I'll, lift, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on this. I probably okay. as we go through. Let's it. Let's get back to okay. the bill. I've yeah. diverted yeah. this far enough. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all relevant. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, but the so the first proposed change that the bill makes to to insanity defense proceedings when you've got uh, a charge involving homicide or attempted homicide. You'll see it's at the very bottom of page two. Now remember, remember I said that the initial order of commitment, generally speaking, is for 90 days for, all, for other types of offenses. Mm -hmm. The proposal here is that the initial order of commitment is for not less than three years, and this is going to go from page two over to page three, not less than three years if the person, if the, uh, person committed under the order was adjudicated not guilty by reason of insanity for a homicide or attempted homicide. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. So that's a proposed uh, different policy for this universe of defendants. And so that means that 
the, um, the court hearing. How does a court hearing fit into that three-year time? Uh, well, the initial court hearing still happens to determine whether or not the person is dangerous or not. Yep. If the court finds, yes, the person is, they've got to be committed to DMH, this initial order has to be for three years. After that, they have to be uh, reevaluated every year. So they would okay. still have to make a, a determination within the next year whether or not the person still pose a danger to themselves or others. If they do, they could keep them committed. Uh, if they don't, then the person can be released. Could it be either hospitalized or not hospital order? That's an interesting question. That came up during justice oversight as well. Uh, the the do you mean under this language, the yeah. commitment language? That because was, it says committed, and they can yes. be committed under either a hospital order or a non-hospital order. I would ask uh, the department that question. Okay. When we asked that question uh, at Justice Oversight, the thought was possibly they wanted to look into it further. I'm just a little confused. So this language seems to say that it's three years regardless. Yes. But you just said they would be reevaluated every year and they could be released. After, after the three, three years. years. After. Yes, exactly. Are after they the evaluated three. during the three years? Yeah. Uh, they might. I don't know. That's another question for the department. They might be, but they could not be. They, the commitment order could not be for less than three years, okay. initially. So it doesn't. It doesn't matter under this language. What's the actual uh, state of affairs according to the, the medical health professionals? It doesn't matter if they say they're not a danger to, to themselves or others, it's going to be three years or not. Correct. Everybody good with that, mm -hmm. that piece of it? All right, so uh, the next difference between uh, the general proceedings and the ones that are proposed here for uh, defendants who are charged with homicide or attempted homicide, is it kind of goes from pages three and four. This talks about the general process for what happens when a person might be discharged. Everybody see that? That's on line five, existing law. So this sort of sets up what happens when a person, they've been committed, right? We've got this initial order, uh, in this case, a three-year order, uh, um, although the existing language you see on page three, that would apply generally, so those initial orders are 90 days. But there are then specific procedures laid out for what happens when somebody uh, may get discharged from DMH custody, and there are specific provisions about at least 10 days before this discharge, there has to be a hearing, it has to be in the family division, that sort of thing some specifics. So over on page four, what the proposal does is it provides a different type of procedure, a different set of parameters around the potential for discharge than you have with respect to these defendants charged with um, other offenses. So uh, you'll see top of page four, 2A lays that out specifically. It says this subdivision applies when a person is committed uh, after they've been adjudicated not guilty by reason of insanity for homicide or attempted homicide. See that? So that's sort of setting up. These procedures are set are different than the other ones. And all right, well, what, what characteristics of this, this procedure are different? You see they start uh, being set out there in subdivision B. Ten-day thing is similar. So at least ten days prior to discharging the person, there has to be a hearing. That's similar. But you see there's two other on lines five through seven um, types of actions that the department might take that also require hearing. It's not just discharge. At least ten days prior to discharge, discontinuing treatment of the person in a secure residential recovery facility, all right, at least 10 days prior to that, or determining not to apply for an order for continued treatment for the person. Everybody see that, line six through seven? Those were not in uh, the general insanity defense language we just looked at. So in any one of those situations, and those are all different actions that the department might take with respect to somebody who's been committed, at least 10 days before any of those happens, um, the commissioner has to provide notice to the state's attorney, see that in line nine, any victim of the, defense, of the offense and the criminal division oh, that held the initial, initial hearing. Thank you. So you see those are two other differences right there. The victim has to get notice, and the hearing is in the criminal division, not the family division. But you see that? So that's mm -hmm. distinct from the procedure that you saw on the previous page for other defendants as well. So there has to be notice of the, of the proposal that the court's going to do this, whether it's discharge the person, discontinue treatment at, at the secure facility, or not apply for a continued treatment order. Any one of those things might happen. Uh, the department has to give notice 10 days beforehand, and then the court has to have a hearing. That's lines 12 and 13. The criminal division has to hold a hearing on whether or not this proposed action, whether it's discharge, discontinuance, et cetera, 
uh, should occur. Uh, you see that line 13 and 14, the state's attorney and the victim have standing to be heard at the hearing. That's also a unique feature of this uh, procedure. And then you'll see lines 15 through 17, an important distinction. The party seeking the proposed action, that means the person who's proposing that uh, the defendant be discharged or their treatment be discontinued, something like that, uh, they have the burden of proving by a preponderance of the evidence, more likely than not, that the proposed action would not cause an unreasonable risk to public safety. Now that's different than your sort of ordinary approach to other defendants that uh, I just pointed you to. In that case, the burden is not on the party seeking the discharge, it's on the state to show um, that the person is no longer a risk to themselves or others. So it's a, it's a sometimes, depending on the facts and who, who wants the, the person discharge or their treatment discontinued, it could potentially place the burden on a different party. Cool. Mm -hmm. cool. Could could be the, it could be the defendant, him or herself. Or their family. Or Correct. Or I would think it would be the defendant. But I mean, See, someone from the outside could come in on their behalf, other than, say, their guardian or lawyer? Well, no, I mean that guardian. That type oh, of oh, that's oh right. okay. Exactly. Because it's have, you. Sorry, they would have the least means, probably. Right. Um, usually. In other words, a group on the outside couldn't come in and do it. Right. It'd be someone with standing. Someone with standing. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Not just any random person. No, I didn't mean that. Right. Exactly. Uh, and that standard is similar to the federal standard, just FYI, and that the, that the burden is on the party seeking the action. Um, that's sort of where that language originated. So that's, they have this hearing, the court has to make this determination. If they do find by a preponderance of the evidence, this is at the very bottom of the page now, that the proposed action would not cause an unreasonable risk to public safety, then they issue this order saying the commissioner can go ahead and proceed with the proposed action. But if they don't, then they have to issue an order directing the commissioner not to proceed, whether it's not to proceed with discharge or um, discontinuance of treatment, that sort of thing, whatever is in the proposed action to begin with. So then what happens there? Is there another court hearing to determine that there should be another three years? The three years is only for the initial, uh, okay. the initial, um, oh, all right. could, after that it's, it's up to one year after that. But yes, you're right, oh, that there okay. could be another hearing and, and there does have to be another hearing um, at least every year. And does it say that someplace here? Yes, that's, oh. how, that's cross, not here, but it's cross-referenced okay. um, by virtue of referring okay. to the civil commitment statutes, okay. yes. And that's essentially uh, the substantive differences to the insanity defense. Oh, perfect timing. I was literally going to just say the, uh, the sections related that come after that are related to data gathering, reporting uh, by various entities, the court, the state's attorney's office, the Department of State's attorneys, I should say, Defender General. Um, and uh, uh, those pieces were ones that Katie put together that the committee could also look at. Also but, explain it, uh, and we will hear from some of them <coughs> later. But. Right. In the as we work on this bill, but we did hear in justice oversight quite a bit from vic, from the families of victims of some of these crimes, and they're concerned that they are pretty they're left out in the dark. They have no idea what's happened because it's considered medical information once that insanity plea has been made, and they can't even be told when this person's going to be released. And it would take some exemptions. I think you're going to get into that. But, um, that was also one of the goals of the bill is to <coughs> have a better way to hold people, but it's also to at least have the victim involved, similar to what we do in the juvenile system, where a victim can be aware of what's happening with the juvenile, but is not allowed to talk about it or tell other people. Uh, that was one of the points I wanted to make about this. Um, it's. Uh, you keep thinking back to Hinckley and how everybody knew about him, the one that shot Baker and, uh, tried, to, and tried to assassinate Reagan. Um, you know, everybody knew all the information about him, but that was before he hmm. If um, that happened in Vermont, we wouldn't have a clue, <clears throat> right? Yeah, and on, on the HIPAA point that you're raising, Senator Sears, um, there is a, an, an exception in HIPAA for disclosures of 
protected health information that are required by law. Remember, we did that in the in the ERPO, the Emergency yep. Risk Protection Order. We've crafted some language, put it in there. Yeah, the governor vetoed it. Not the ERPO one, I think. Yeah, yeah. He did. Oh, you mean the one? Yes, the one that from that yeah. was in the S one seventy nine from last year. Seventy nine, right? Yeah, yeah. Wherever. That's right. <coughs> but we the governor didn't like that either. <laughs> I don't think he had a problem with that. Right. But waiting, waiting period. Right. But we could come up with if you decide you want to go that route, we could. Uh, well, come I think up we do need to. Uh, we yeah. do need to provide some okay. information to victims. Right. In some way. They need to at least know what's happening. Now, I, I can't imagine if you were the subject of an attempted murder and you are you're shopping downtown Bennington and the murderer, the, the person who attempted murder on you just happens to be in the next aisle. Anyway, you want to give Katie the sure. Sorry, that's sure. it works. Yep, can I'll work through the second half of the bill. Yes, yeah, great. Please do. And we've got a number of witnesses on. We got David Cahill on the phone and Matt Valerio and David Scher here. I can't remember if Pepper's on us. Pepper's here, but is David representing you or? Is David can, but you know, from a department standpoint, uh, I'd be happy to testify. Yeah. How come you weren't down in Bennington yesterday? Everybody yeah, no else, one else was there. Down there. Yeah. Campbell's on the front page of the Bennington banner. Yeah. But what was happening? Let him know scene? that he pushed uh, Campion right off the front page. That takes some doing. There's a 30 year old sex assault case. Oh, the guy from Lanthrop. Has been, the guy was adjudicated guilty and then uh, had a there was a mistrial declared, and they've been trying to try him, and he claims that he has a heart condition. He's down in Florida, <coughs> and he claims to have a heart condition that would, at a trial would kill him, and it's been going on for like 30 years. And it's, it's a bizarre case, and Jeff Amistoy, John Campbell, and uh, Burgess, Burgess, Brian Burgess are special prosecutors. They've taken, I don't, is it the state's attorneys, or is the attorney general's taken? It was an attorney general case, but then we hired, the department hired the attorney general who was assigned to it. So he became a deputy state's attorney, but he kept the case. Oh, thank you. So it's an odd sort of situation now. And we have special prosecutors assigned from, uh, well, the Brian Burgess and Jeff Amistoy. And was Jeff Amistoy was still practicing. I, I think he, he originally, Brian Burgess originally had this case. He was involved in the case. Speaking of interesting cases, I don't know, but anyway, Campbell took Campion off the front page this morning. Go ahead. All right. Please. Katie McGlynn, Office of Legislative Counsel. As Eric said, uh, the second half of the bill turns to uh, various reporting requirements, data collection, so I'll walk you through those sections. Starting at section two, this has to do with the availability of psychiatric support services. So a determination by the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs and the Defender General um, is required as to whether each has sufficient and comparable resources to fund psychiatric support or evalu evaluative services. And this report would be due by November 1st of this year. Moving on to the next page, the report would include an inventory of how existing funds are used to fund psychiatric support services or evaluative services. In section three, um, this has to do with an assessment of uh, mental health services that are provided in a corrections setting. So again, by November 1st of this year, DMH and DOC would jointly submit an inventory and evaluation of mental, mental health services provided by the entity that DOC contracts with for healthcare services. The evaluation would include a comparison as to how the type frequency and timeliness of mental health services provided in a correctional setting uh, differ from those offered within the community. So just a comparison of services in correctional facility versus in the community. Um, also the report is to address how the MOU that was executed between DMH and DOC impacts 
uh, mental health services that are provided by the Department of Corrections healthcare vendor. I think this one should go to the Senate institutions as well, because I think there may be a discussion of a forensic unit at some point, like similar to what is available in other states. And uh, there's been some discussion of that as they consider the different facilities. And um, so uh, Senator Benning's committee should, should also receive that report. Okay. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see some recommendations in that vein. I think I have an idea of building it. It's going to be available in July. I do too. Well, you do, but yours and, yours and mine may not match. We may not. <laughs> okay. Okay. The next section, section four, uh, creates a forensic care working group. By August of this year, DMH is to convene a work group of stakeholders, including the Department of Corrections, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, the Defender General, the Office of the Attorney General, and the purpose of this work group would be to identify gaps in current mental health and criminal in the criminal justice structure and opportunities to improve public safety and coordination of treatment. This would include a review of competency restoration models that are used in other states and recommendations for treatment uh, management of and the management of individuals. Um, who are not guilty by reason of insanity. And then in subsection B, the report with the working group's findings would be submitted by DMH on November 1st of this year, and it's to include a survey and literature review of competency restoration programs, including Connecticut's um, Psychiatric Security Review Board, and a look at um, the ability for those type of models to be replicated in Vermont. And lastly, uh, Section 5 is an appropriation, um, and it's an appropriation to DMH for the purpose of funding a public education campaign regarding how the forensic care system operates in Vermont and how it addresses patient needs and public safety. How do we come up with $8,000? <laughs> <laughs> Seems a little bit of a digit. They know I would never get through appropriation. <laughs> I think you should ask Senator Clark's. Okay. Clarkson? She's one of the co-sponsors. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> Bill, that's a good question. Seems, seems like a very small sum. I think someone mentioned some either. study that had been done a few years back. Or I can't like that. Uh, it's a public education campaign, I'm sure that. I mean, is, is this... I don't remember where that came from. <laughs> Do you? No. Katie, do you I can't remember. All right. That's the, the number I was given to plug in. Okay. <laughs> so would this be after we've had these other things done or right at the same Did time? Did that come from I mean, the governor's office? Maybe the public education campaign is how bad this is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why are we doing that <laughs> right now? I think it was just to be a small, you know, campaign so people would have information. I think they'd find out. That Did you make that not? suggestion, David Cahill? Uh, I, I did a, disclaim any ownership or knowledge of anything other than section one. Okay, nice. All right, we'll have an investigation into where the eight thousand came from. And not only the eight thousand. Is it a good idea? That's the question. The question really for the committee is: Is it a good idea? And then appropriations would need to figure out what it's going to cost. Yeah. Does the yeah. public really need to know how the forensic care system works? Where the flaws are? Do they care? Yeah. Well, well, they, they care, care that people get out. Well, they, they care what the results are, but not anyway. They know what's going on. The way this is written, it's pretty. Okay. I, I will take ownership for the 8,000. That was my brilliant <laughs> idea. <laughs> I think somebody said, what's the number? And I just threw something out there. I, so I'll take on behalf of I think people. it was really Senator Clarkson. I'm not saying whether I love this bill or not, but on behalf of victims in that particular state, it seems to me victims' advocates ought to be vested with that knowledge yeah. to be able to explain to them, and that might not cost us a dime. Right. <clears throat> Good suggestion, Joe. That's part of the problem is the victims. Um, you know, that, uh, I've got a letter here that came from uh, a relative of one of the individuals who was murdered. I don't have the names of the family, but 
anyway, uh, I thought there was a section on victims notification. What happens to that section? Well, there are pieces in section one it's about the victims have standing and have the ability oh, okay. to appear at the hearing. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. That, are any questions for Katie besides the 8,000? Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. Um, next is David Cahill. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Good morning. Yeah. Well, first, I just wanted to thank Liz Council for giving me a solid half an hour to get my email fixed. Uh, that was much appreciated. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and now with, uh, with all the resources of the state, I can give you my two cents on Section 1. Uh, first, it's, it's worth just asking what got us here. Uh, those of you on Justice Oversight are, are likely familiar, um, perhaps more familiar than you'd like to be, uh, with what got us here, but I'll go over it briefly. Um, as, as currently laid out, Vermont's mental health statutes make very little distinction uh, between a person who is accused of a crime but is incompetent to stand trial and uh, as a result is never adjudicated on the merits of the crime. Uh, the Vermont law does not distinguish well between that person and a person who commits no crime and is admitted into the mental health system by virtue of having a major mental illness or being a threat to him or herself. So uh, there are individuals who come into the custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health uh, through, uh, through a court process or through a search warrant process um, and, and have committed no crime. Uh, and those individuals are treated remarkably similarly to those who are incompetent. And they're also uh, treated remarkably similarly to those who are insane. Those who are insane are individuals who uh, have gone to trial and it has been determined by the fact finder, usually a jury, sometimes a judge, been determined by the fact finder to have committed the offense beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and then the fact finder further determined that the defendant have, had proven by a preponderance of the evidence uh, that the defendant is relieved of criminal responsibility by virtue of being insane. Uh, and I won't uh, recap the definition of insanity. Harris went over that with you. Uh, so the issue right now is that these three very different populations are treated uh, the exact same once they come into the mental health system. And by that I mean uh, they are entitled to being treated as a patient first. They are a receiver of health care services. Um, they are not seen uh, to be a public safety threat first and foremost. They are a patient in the custody of the care of the commissioner and they are entitled to treatment as a patient as anyone else would, including <coughs> health care um, and uh, likewise, they all are uh, subject to an initial commitment order that is a maximum of 90 days. Um, and after that 90 days, uh, a commitment order can be renewed for a period of up to one year, and then again at intervals of up to one year after that time. Uh, but the litmus test, it, again, is medical necessity. What is the least restrictive environment necessary to treat this patient? Um, are there medical goals that are yet to be achieved? Um, there is very little public safety analysis, and to the extent there is a public safety analysis, it's, re it's really backdoored in, in, in that uh, a patient could be a risk of further harm to himself or others by virtue of committing future crimes, and that's how we account for public safety. But it's important to note that under the law as it is now written, um, the criminal court always has the authority to require a uh, what we would call a discharge hearing where public safety can be taken into account for that first 90-day order, which is another way of saying that if we have an insane murderer who a jury all agreed committed the murder and who a jury all agreed was insane at the time of committing the murder, the court can order that if the person is discharged within 90 days from the Commissioner of Public Health or, or Mental Health that there needs to be a court hearing on that topic. Um, however, once the initial 90-day order expires and we're now on renewed order, the public safety hearing requirement drops out. Uh, and any further determination regarding whether the person needs to be in custody in a secure facility or in an outpatient facility or not in custody at all walking the street, that is the determination that is made by the Commissioner of Mental Health without judicial review. Uh, and typically without notification to the state attorney's office, to the victim advocate, 
or the victim, because to do so would be to violate uh, health care privacy. Uh, none of what I'm saying is a criticism of the Department of Mental Health or the Commissioner of Mental Health. It is simply an accurate statement of the law. And we should understand that what, what DMH does and what we have perhaps read about in the news is, is them simply doing their job following the law. It is for us to decide, however, going forward, what the law should be. Uh, a good example is the Arnaldo Cruz case out of Springfield, Vermont, where he, um, he stabbed his girlfriend in the neck and killed her. Um, an expert witness for the defense agreed, uh, it indicated that he was insane at the time of the offense. The state expert uh, indicated that he could not refute the defense claim. Um, the civilian witnesses in the case uh, when interviewed by my office um, indicated grave concerns about his mental health and quote unquote described him as crazy. Um, based upon that, uh, we had a court trial on the issue of insanity. Um, the judge determined based upon uh, the evidence that he was insane. He was placed in the custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health uh, in December. And as I understand it, he was out on the streets of Springfield, Massachusetts by the following October. Um, and the question for all of us is that, A, um, is this a one-off experience? Is this the only insane murderer who's going to ever walk the street? Uh, and, and B, if the answer is no, if this is something that could be replicated, um, should we be concerned about that happening? Um, should we be concerned about the notion that someone who has factually committed a murder um, is out mingling with the public less than a year later? Um, and from my perspective, the answer is that yes, this is something that is going to happen. It is going to recur. Um, one could take a look at what happened in Chittenden County or take a look at what happened in my county and say, well, you know, blame it on the prosecutor. The prosecutor didn't do the right thing. The prosecutor made the wrong judgment. The jury might have uh, convicted the person uh, and caused them to go to prison. And that may very well be true, but the reality is that the system still needs to be able to properly accommodate insane individuals who have actually committed homicides and attempted homicide. And right now, our system is not equipped to do that. Um, the, the Department of Mental Health does not have a facility where they would be still comfortable lodging someone long term. Um, they don't have the statutory authority that really allows them to lodge someone long term. Uh, but each of us, deep down, knows that for public safety, if we have someone who has killed once, we really owe it to the public to carefully monitor that person to ensure that they are truly stable before turning them back out on the street. It's not enough to say, we watched them for 90 days, he's on new meds now, he seems happy, he seems calm, he probably won't kill again. Uh, we, we need a greater level of certainty before those types of individuals are out in the public, which is why, um, why in this bill there's a three-year commitment term proposed. Um, some other jurisdictions have longer commitment terms. New Hampshire commits for five years. Um, there may be some concerns in the room about due process. Well, uh, what can we truly commit someone for a period longer than 90 days without violating their due process rights? Um, and the answer is absolutely. Um, first, New Hampshire's, New Hampshire's five-year term is basically valid under the federal constitution. It has not been effectively challenged. Um, Secondly, uh, we need to take note of the fact that insane individuals have had their due process up front. They have been in front of the judge or jury. They had their adjudication on the merit. They were, the sufficient facts were found to convict. They were excused from the conviction by virtue of being insane. That level of due process is very different from insane individuals, or I'm, I'm sorry, from incompetent individuals or individuals who have committed no crime because those latter two categories have not been the subject of an adjudication on the merit. But with the same individuals, they had their due process. They had their day in court. Now we need to consider public safety. Um, some folks might be thinking, well, okay, so this is a narrow bill. Why is it so narrow? Because the idea is to focus on the most egregious circumstances, and that really is the insane murderer. Um, I understand there are proposals for broader mental health bills out there. 
um, we should discuss those on their own merit. Um, this is intended to be rather than really focused. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll thank you for uh, enduring through my monologue. Uh, Senator Baruth has a question. Uh, I, I have a, a couple couple small points. Um, so you, you are tending to use the phrase insane murderer, um, which I don't necessarily think is the, the best way to phrase it. Um, but the bill also includes attempted homicide. So the, the people aren't murderers according to the juries, right? All the time? Well, um, yes, it's true that the difference between, uh, unfortunately, the difference between uh, a murder and attempted murder is really how good their aim is. Because they have the same intent. They intend to kill. Well, but they are, tech am, am I correct that they're not murderers? So they, this bill includes murderers plus attempted murder. Right. Then my other question is, if they've had their due process rights up front, could you change the time from 90 days to 20 years? Uh, well, you know, the interesting thing is that's exactly what we do for individuals who are adjudicated on the merits and found criminally responsible. Mm -hmm. um, and I suspect, the US, I suspect the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, by virtue of the case that Senator Sears brought up, is going to give us some insight into that. Um, it, it, I'm simply noting that the 90-day return to court requirement and then the one-year return to court requirement thereafter is intended, intended to provide a level of due process to individuals who have not had their day in court, who have not had their criminal trial and adjudication. Um, well, first of all, I, you know, we, we went through a series of uh, discussions last year over Jack Sawyer and the attempt language in Vermont, and actually, or was it the year before? I don't know how long ago. It was a long time ago. Um, might have been two, might have been one. And whenever, anyway, we went through the attempt laws in Vermont, and you do have to be pretty much mm -hmm. the poor aim to be the attempt. Um, but I want to, David, uh, during justice oversight, there was testimony from one individual who said, once they have been found to be not guilty by reason of insanity, they're patients. And yeah. as patients, uh, the person had a heart condition, you wouldn't, well, maybe heart condition's a bad point because of this court case, but uh, as patients, you wouldn't necessarily be holding them accountable um, in the same manner. You look at patients as different. You, you get try to get them healthy. And I, I think that's part of the, the push and pull here. Um, but I think most Vermonters agree that what they saw in your jurisdiction and what they saw in Burlington isn't the best outcome. So I, I do think people feel that they need, need to be, um, needs to be a change. That's why I introduced the bill along with Senator Lyons and Clarkson. Is that in the staff? And Senator Clarkson is because she went to dinner with with State Attorney Cahill, and they come up with this idea. Is, is it in the statute that once the person is found to be insane, that it's an automatic? It's, where does it say that, that it's an automatic that they're committed to the Department of Mental Health? Is that in the statute? Yes. Well, if, if you know, that's a good point, Senator Nicka. And, um, you know, if that, that harkens back to the point that um, Senator Sears just made, which is, the whole notion that these individuals are patients. They, they are patients because uh, prior General Assemblies have created this funnel with a disparate group, you know, the incompetent, the insane, and the civilly committed all funnel into the same statutory scheme. Um, so so this, this is because it was written into law, not because it should be. Um, it, and I, I guess that's another way of saying that what, what we're doing through this bill is really trying to disentangle some groups that really shouldn't be lumped together. So can I just yep. ask the question sorry, about, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Go ahead. just about the, the three years, it sounded very 
um, harsh and long to me when I first read it. And then I'm thinking, if I um, shoot Senator Sears right now, um, I would probably be sent to prison for a fairly long period of time. Clear defense of justifiable homicide. Justifiable homicide, okay. But if I shot Senator Benning. That would definitely be a long period of time. Yeah. Long period of time. But if I um, had some kind of a break or, so I would be sent to prison for a fairly long time. But if, if in that defense, I was found to be at the time insane, then I would be essentially sentenced for three years with a repr potential reprieve after three years. Is that, do I understand? It, does that make sense to you, David? So it, that is right, and let me explain the rationale behind it. So, um, so, let, so let's say, regrettably, uh, you were found insane uh, for one of those murders, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you are sent to a, a mental institution in the custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health. Mm -hmm. uh, and there you're put on, you're diagnosed, you're put on a new medication regimen. Um, the, the new Senator White, who is now medicated, seems a little less violent than the old Senator White. Um, you know, you had some effective talk therapy. There's also enormous pressure to get you out of that uh, mental health bed because there are not a lot of them, and they're needed for other people who are coming in the pipeline for all those other things, like for being incompetent or for being civilly committed, uh, or other people who are insane. And so invariably, there's going to be some pressure to get you out the door. And the question is, when you're pushed out the door on day 91, or day 180, or day 365, do we really know that you're going to stay on your meds? Do we really know you're not going to become the old Senator White who <laughs> enjoyed being herself uh, without those meds and without the talk therapy? Um, and the idea behind the three-year commitment is to ensure that the folks in the medical facility providing the appropriate level of care to you have the opportunity to see several cycles of your behavior to see you being happy, to see you being sad, to see you taking your meds, to see you refusing to take your meds, um, so that they can get a genuine long-term perspective on whether you have stabilized or not. Right, and so I, I would get, be getting a sentence of less, much less if I was deemed insane than, I would, than the sentence I would get if I was deemed sane when I shot him. Well, it's kind of apples and oranges in the sense well, that... Well, it's a different sentence, but... Well, well let, let, let's think through how it would work. So if you get convicted of second-degree murder, the presumptive sentence is 20 years to life, which means um, on year 20, uh, you're eligible for parole, parole or get to see the parole board. Maybe right. they let you out, then maybe you don't. Maybe they don't. Um, maybe there's a good time law by then if you get out in year 15. We don't know. Um, now... If you get found insane, you're in for three years, mm -hmm. uh, and then you can be committed for an additional year, subject to a court hearing every year. Right. Uh, and so you could be in there, like Dave Hinckley, you could be in there for 36 years, or you could be in there for only three years. Right. That, that will be informed by public safety. I get my parole hearing after three years if I'm insane. Yep. Right. Yes. Okay. Okay, Senator I just, Benning, did you have a comment on her or on the um, bill? It will take too long for me to comment on Senator White, but I would like to talk about the, the bill. Um, David, I'm, I heard you describe earlier the narrowness of this <coughs> bill, I think that was your word, for homicide, attempted homicide, from a prosecutorial standpoint, which is admittedly not one of my fortes. What would you then say to a victim of a serial rapist or a victim who is left in a wheelchair as a result of a conviction for an aggravated assault with weapon? Um, it seems to me that if you're going to go down this road, there are other offenses that might be just as bad, or even reaching to the point of a Jack Sawyer. What do you? Why are you not addressing that in this bill? Well, I, I say to them with all honesty, I, I wish we could have gotten a broader bill through the Senate and through the house <laughs> but i don't think we would um, now it, it, granted you're in the room you're in the building if you think that there actually would be traction 
uh, for a broader bill, um, that would be great. Because frankly, as prosecutors, uh, we recognize that first statutory, the current statutory scheme is like, it's like Swiss cheese. There are lots of holes, people are falling through them. Um, it's not just this population, it's also, you know, the guys who are committing sexual assault and have a traumatic brain injury and go into the custody of the department of nothing. There's no department that will take them. I, I don't know whether it would gain traction or not, but I think the answer is if if something like that were to be attempted, the three-year automatic placement would probably come up as uh, something that has to be flexible to accommodate those situations. The other question I have is from the other side of the spectrum. This bill vests a victim with not only the right to notice, but also standing in a conversation about whether a person should be continued or discontinued in treatment. And I don't understand the connection of how a victim would have the um, scientific expertise to participate in that conversation. I would submit that what they have is the emotional uh, argument about whether somebody should remain in or not. And I, I see that as particularly problematic. What's your response to that? So, um, again, one of the features of this bill is that it changes that conversation upon renewal of the commitment order to not just the medical necessity, but also the demands of public safety. Uh, and one thing I've noticed about old homicides and attempted homicides is that there's really one person who remembers the facts better than anybody else. Um, that's the victim and the victim's family. Uh, obviously, it's the surviving victim only an attempted homicide. Uh, because, you know, in these old cases, judges come and go, prosecutors come and go, commissioners come and go, but the victim and their family always remember, and, and, and they are there to ensure that the fact finder understands the fact. Well, if this person has been committed for a period of time, of, in this case three years, um, wouldn't the assumption be automatically that they were in a serious crime situation? I mean, I. Personally, as I read through this, I'm envisioning a case where emotions are brought to the table and not the scientific question of whether or not an individual should continue or be discontinued in treatment. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm going to ask the rest of the folks who are proposing this to answer that because that particular piece leaves me a little uncomfortable. I certainly understand why they should have notice, but whether they have standing to actually give testimony uh, on the scientific question of whether they should be continued is leaving me I think, uncomfortable. I think the intent, uh, you, it's a good point. I, I, I think the intent of the sponsors was to provide some information about their own feelings of safety and not necessarily the whether or not the person was treated. I, that, that standing would be to, um, if, if this person who murdered um, the woman in, in White River Junction and her family still felt threatened by that individual, that's the idea was the victim would have some kind of a say on that basis. But I think that's Joe's point. Are their feelings to be elevated to the level of the, the medical uh, well, I mean, it's something to keep in mind when the yeah. state's attorney um, in the case of uh, Elizabeth Teague went to, um, that's public because she wasn't under HIPAA, I think. But anyway, I know that the state attorney made the case that, that she felt that she was, he was, she was, she felt she was still dangerous mm -hmm. and that um, the community would be um, worried about her release. Mm -hmm. From and you know that was I, I don't remember exactly what the details were, so I think there is that through the state's attorney, but we can work on that. It's a good point. They certainly shouldn't have standing on the treatment. And it but, just says standing to be heard. Right. Yeah. So I, I think the idea was to be heard about the their feelings about this individual. There was a case where somebody was, it was an attempted murder, the person failed, and that person didn't even know they were being policed. Well, from a defense attorney's perspective, you've shifted the burden to the defendant to prove 
that their treatment should be uh, discontinued. And when I see the victim having a say in that conversation, um, it's they could have all the psychiatrists in the world, but if the emotion in the room is ratcheted up based on the, the victim's feelings, I don't know how you overcome that. And that's well, let's, before we start marking up, you've identified some problems. I'd like to hear from at least David Schur and uh, Matt Valerio in the final half hour we have. <coughs> Who wants to go first? You want to go? It's all of the Stadies can go together. <laughs> <laughs> all the Stadies can go together. I like it. And anyone else who wants to testify on this bill, check with Peggy. First question. She'll be Are back. And she had to leave at 11 30. She'll be back shortly. And um, you can check with Peggy and uh, testify at a future meeting of the committee on this bill. David, thank oh. you for being here. All right, thank you for having me. For the record, David. Thank you. Do you want to hang up? up? I, I'll, I'll hang up before the state turns off my cell phone as well. Okay. okay. <laughs> Bye, David. Thank you. Bye. I'm glad you. Thank you for being here with us. Happy child rearing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, for the record, David Chair with the Attorney General's Office. I'd start off the testimony by saying certainly the Attorney General shares the goals of this bill uh, with respect to ensuring public safety where, uh, with these most serious crimes as well as um, ensuring sufficient victim notification and input on some of these processes. Um, I'm going to divide my testimony in three general parts. One is some sort of general big picture issues that we wanted to make sure the committee is considering. A few technical things, which I'll run through quickly, because I imagine we'll deal with that in more, in more detail at future hearings. And then briefly wanted to mention um, competence, which in this bill is addressed with a uh, committee, a forensic care working group, but wanted to just mention a couple things on that quickly. So with the general issues, starting with the big picture issues, and I've been working closely with our criminal division on reviewing the bill and thinking through these issues, and I should say our Criminal Division Chief is sitting behind me, Domenica Pendula. We've been discussing this bill. Um, I think one of the big things that we want to emphasize, and this, while this isn't directly on the point of the procedures that are laid out in this bill, it is an important underlying consideration that is going to affect how these things work. From a practical standpoint, when, we are, when um, lawyers are litigating in court on these issues, uh, what comes into play is the resource issue in terms of adequate facilities and adequate forensic facilities, uh, especially for these most serious cases, uh, and having um, everything be funded through Medicaid and the various uh, rules and requirements that come with that, as opposed to general fund dollars, which give the state uh, a little more leeway to set its own rules, which is not to say that there aren't issues that remain, HIPAA issues and things like that, that any medical professional will have to work with, but um, that underlying issue of everything being funded through Medicaid and not having a dedicated forensic facility that is out of the state general fund is always going, in our view, is as a practical matter, going to limit the options that we have, even if we were to make a big change like this or something similar, the ability to execute on it is going to be severely hampered. And again, I realize that's a little bit outside the purview of just the procedural questions that are addressed in this bill, but we think it's important for the committee to be aware of that as a big picture issue. Um, these procedural solutions really won't be able to, or a procedural solution like this, won't be able to put it be put in place without addressing that larger issue. Um, another point that I wanted to bring up. You mean the forensic unit? That's right. Uh, I agree with you. What's that? I agree with you. That's why I, I really hope that the state will look at that. Because it is, it is a problem. Uh, if you're trying to get person A out because you got person B coming in who is mentally ill but is not a criminal, and you've got the person who committed a murder may or may not be continued dangerous, and you're pushing the murderer out. 
I'm not sure that's the right public safety. That's right, and again, that, that issue we think is going to underlie any that's what we're trying to practical to. solution here. Um, but you do raise a, another question I have from all of this is, as the Attorney General, Matt, Tupper, and others can answer for me, but we know there's a number of people who are incarcerated who are seriously mentally ill. Not serious functional impairment, but seriously mentally ill. And those people weren't lucky enough to be found incompetent by reason of insanity? Or, I mean, how does that all work? I hesitate to comment on cases without knowing well, I don't, I don't have a specific case in mind, but it just it troubles me that I walk into a correctional facility and I see people who are seriously mentally ill, and I can talk to people. And I see other people who are dangerously, um, very borderline, um, developmentally disabled, clearly, by just their response to questions I ask them or conversations I have. And they wait a minute, this person's in jail, been found guilty of a crime, and is, you know, doing their time. And yet this other person is out because they were deemed mentally ill, even though they murdered somebody. And this poor sucker just happened to punch the wrong person. I think procedurally speaking, what can happen uh, is that these are cases where with the insanity defense, for example, it really is a question of fact as to what was happening at the time of the crime. And so, you know, I don't know these specific individual why cases, Kansas but... Did what they did. Yeah. Um, with, you know, it could be the case that somebody's found insane at the time of a crime, or, or sorry, not found insane at the time of a crime is uh, adjudicated guilty, uh, but presents as seriously uh, incompetent moving forward, and they are incarcerated under their sentence. That's certainly the law as it stands allows for that outcome. I've got a constituent who's 18 years old and been in Rockland Correctional Facility since the middle of October after he graduated from DCF, um, the disability, I never get Dale right, but I call him Dale or Dial or whatever that, that operation is, are actually working with the family, working with the local mental health center to set up programs for him. Um, but he's sitting in jail. Um, yeah, evidently, uh, his assault wasn't Huh? His assault wasn't bad enough to qualify? Or well, or his situation wasn't insane. He wasn't insane at the time of the crime, of the assault. So he sits in jail, and a guy could murder somebody and be out. That's almost, he's been in almost 90 days now. So if you think of the 90 day, that person could be out. And I think a little it, unfairness there, I think. I think you raise an important point, Senator, and... and a parallel issue with respect to uh, treatment services that are available for our incarcerated population. Um, and I think that's certainly something that we should discuss. I mean, he's being held about. without bail, so he doesn't, he's not even eligible for a certain treatment unless he accepts it. So it's, a, it's a very discouraging system that we've created. I understand why Kansas did what they did. And, you know, these fundamental fairness issues with regards to who uh, has what out there <coughs> is something that I think we... It's systemic. It's, I mean, I think that how we deal with these mental illness issues, we uh, could be doing better. I, I don't think there's any question about that. And um, we need to figure out ways so that the results for society, for you, Senator, for all of us, feel fair when we see them. I mean, that is a basic uh, outcome that we need to achieve, and I think we would agree that we aren't there, and we need to do work. Um, one other, another issue I'd like to just bring up, and the committee already did discuss this a bit, and I think we have some more work to do, and I'll be honest with the committee, we don't have the answer right now. <laughs> we are continuing to research and need to look into it, uh, and, and need to figure it out a little bit more, but that is, as the 
uh, committee was discussing the three year term of um, confinement. There is, this does touch on constitutional questions. Um, it does touch on the question of when, under what uh, authority somebody can be held and uh, what processes do for somebody who's being held uh, who, under the laws of our state, there are other ways of doing this, but under the laws of our state is, has been adjudicated not guilty by reason of insanity. Um, and as State Attorney Cahill mentioned, we have provisions where you know we have the 90-day period that's followed by a one-year period. Uh, in that, in, under our current laws, that one-year period does still afford the ability for a review in the midst of those years. So, in other words, somebody's being held or confined, I should say, uh, because they are mentally ill. The question that's being asked as to the necessity, of, as to whether the confinement is necessary, is a question of their mental condition. Um, somebody's being incarcerated because they're guilty, that's a separate issue. Uh, and we need to make sure we have sufficient due process in place and consider that issue of periods. You know, three, it's three years without the ability to check that is a, a providing adequate due process. State Attorney Cahill is correct that New Hampshire's a five-year period with essentially the same set of rules. Um, on the flip side, there are Supreme Court cases making it clear that when somebody's being held uh, because they are, because they've been adjudicated insane at the time of the crime, there does need to be an inquiry as to whether the confinement is medically necessary, is clinically indicated. And I think that question of terms and periods is probably, I think, we're not going to find absolute clarity on that, but I do think we should do a little more work on figuring out what the terms of that need to be, whether it's a default three years with the ability to review before or upon motion, whether it's a shorter period uh, without the ability to review, whether that is, in fact, legally adequate. That uh, We just need to do more work on that piece, and I think the committee is right to ask about those issues. A few... Oh, Senator White had a question. Oh, sorry. I, I just was... Um, the question that I asked earlier about whether the commitment meant either either hospitalization or non-hospitalization, order of non-hospitalization, because it, it isn't clear here. So it could be an order of non-hospitalization, the way this reads. I would Before I answer that question definitively, I would want to look at Title 18 okay. in full and uh, make sure that I'm not... Uh, misstating something that's been defined in statute. Okay. So I don't want to give you a definitive answer okay. on that right now, but I can certainly check on that and, and okay. see if that's defined or if it leaves open the possibility that you're mentioning. Okay. I think it does, but... You may well be right. Um, a couple technical issues that we did want to note for the committee. Um, in uh, When you look on page 4, line 6, it makes reference to a secure residential recovery facility. In Title 18, there is mention that such a, or there's indication that such a facility is not actually the most secure facility that you might be in. I will say that a review of Title 18 in full, or I, should, I don't want to claim that I've read every word, but a more complete review of where that term is used um, shows that in one place it's clear that they are not talking about the most secure possible facility. And if that's the case, that renders this subsection a little bit confusing because it seems to be talking about a step down from the most secure location. Um, or it seems to be intended to be talking about a step down from the most secure location. I will say that other uses of that phrase uh, in Title 18 are a little ambiguous, and that's something we may want to straighten out. Um, we would also ask that state's attorney, uh, whenever that's used, we also use attorney general, so there's no confusion that attorney general cases, in attorney general cases, the attorney general's office is standing. Um, in subsection C on page four, we'd also just want to make sure that there is, that the state has sufficient access to information to meaningfully litigate the issues. Um, if the state has to walk into those hearings without access to information, uh, such as treatment records and so forth, there won't be a meaningful hearing on those issues. And we think that as a matter of fairness and uh, as a matter of achieving the goals that we're trying to achieve with respect to public safety and victim notification, that 
should be included. Um, and the final piece I'll mention really quick, and I know we don't have to go into this stuff in detail now, um, just making sure we have the procedure clarified at the end, page, top of page five, line two, we have the procedure clarified as to what would happen if um, there is an order issued not to proceed with a release and making sure we clarify what happens next under this new system we're setting up. And the final piece I'll mention for the committee is around section four, which talks about study and competence. We understand that uh, it's the given section four and it's provision for a working group to review competency issues. Competency probably or may not be something that the committee wants to dive into in this session, in this bill, but we would <coughs> urge the committee to include when we look at that, um, it, it already mentions competency restoration, which we think is important. Uh, obviously, that is an important look at, that an important piece of this, which I'm sure will come up, but the final sort of substantive issue is with respect to competency determinations in court uh, at the under a relatively recent Supreme Court ruling, state Supreme Court ruling, which interpreted statutory law to basically say that, or I should say the effect of what this ruling is, is that if there is a psychiatric opinion that, it, that somebody is not competent to stand trial, it does not leave any room for the state to litigate that with, with evidence that the person, with an examination showing that the person might be competent to stand trial. And again, to be for the sake of fairness, for the sake of making sure that uh, cases are being heard fairly, we do want to make sure that um, there's the ability to be heard and we clarify that statute. I should say the ability to be litigated meaningfully and we should clarify that statute to allow that to happen. There's a few ways we could do that and I'll refrain from going into the details on that right now uh, because I understand that's not the thrust of this bill but I did want to highlight that for the committee um, so that if you are aware of those issues as well. And that is my testimony. I'm happy to answer questions. I do have a question. Um, so I heard you uh, indicating that your office thought further study of the three years was warranted or further discussion. Um, any first blush uh, thoughts? Does, does three years seem uh, initially too much uh, without review? I think the question for us is we're trying to balance this concern around public safety uh, with constitutional requirements. And the pathway there, there's, there's a few different ways we could go when you look at other statutes around the country. There's a, and the, the pathway there, I think, uh, is, is not entirely clear. I do think that um, we support a system that better takes into account questions of public safety and um, you know, the, under the current system, which does allow for relatively rapid release, potentially, of, of dangerous individuals, we do feel like there, hasn't, there isn't sufficient inquiry into that public safety issue and that there has been a push to release um, for whatever clinical reasons that may be. I, I think that a big, you know, I'm, I'm not, I guess I'm not prepared to give you a definitive answer on the term of years, in part because that is so tied up in the legal and questions and uh, case review that I think we need to do more work on. I think in part this does go back, unfortunately, to the facility issue and the funding issue. Um, if in fact we did have a facility that was operating out of the general fund and not under Medicaid rules and that had the capacity to deal with persons who were adjudicated um, not guilty by reason of insanity, some of these issues, not all of them, I think there are process issues that need to be worked out and that this bill helps address, but some of these issues around assuring public safety would be considerably helped by that, that piece alone. Um, and so I think as we think about how to ensure these things, that Sorry, part Matt. can't, we can't leave that part out. Well, I'm looking at that clock and I'm apologizing to Matt for not Joe, you say, I'm assuming that's going to have a long presentation. I'm assuming it does, yeah. yeah. Um, 
Dave, assuming it wouldn't be a five minute. Not even close. Right. Not even close. <laughs> um, would you like an hour? I would. Okay. David, did I understand you said you're still doing research on the hill? That's right. All right. So I, I have a couple of questions. The first one of which, can you at least get some kind of an estimate on what the number of court dates might be added to court dockets as a result of this? Um, the second question, I don't know if this is in your bailiwick, but I would like to know how many additional mental health bed spaces you may be looking at in order to accommodate this. Um, and I, I guess those are the two things that I have request that research be done on. My next question has to do with the victim participation in this discussion. Um, first off, from a prosecutorial standpoint, I think you and I can both agree that the direct victim in a homicide case is dead. They don't care and will not be participating in the conversation. Um, I cannot understand why a victim in a serial rapist case or a victim in an aggravated assault with weapon case um, doesn't have the same argument to make <coughs> as the remaining victims in a homicide case. And by that, I'm going to read you the definition of victim as it's found in our criminal statutes. It says, victims means a person who sustains physical, emotional, or financial injury or death as a direct result of the commission or attempted commission of a crime or act of delinquency. I'll leave that up. It shall also include the family members of, among other things, a homicide victim. So I'm envisioning this statute opens the door for the spouse, the children, and the grandchildren, or however many relatives you want to go, as falling in the definition of a victim in the discussion of whether or not a person who is now vested with the burden of having to establish whether their treatment should continue or not, to me that really muddies up the conversation about is treatment necessary to continue or not. Um, do you agree or disagree with that theory of observation? I think the key piece for our office when we look at that, we did discuss a little bit about uh, victim participation in these, um, or victim presence, is making sure that victims are there, victims have access to information, victims have input with the state's attorney or attorney general's office that's going to be uh, trying these hearings, is going to be involved in these hearings, um, and making sure that there is a mechanism for victim voice in that, uh, and, and maybe the better model is something like uh, what we do now in terms of, um, uh, you know, a, a more defined way in which they will be heard, which is what's currently provided for under the um, victim's rights aspects of it, it, Title 13. It may need to be, be reworked a little, Joe, and reworded. I don't disagree with you. It was not the intent of myself or any of the other sponsors of the bill, or the drafters of the bill, to give victims <coughs> a say in the treatment of the individual any more than I would think a victim has a, as necessarily a say in the treatment of a person in the Department of Corrections. Once they're you know, committed to the Commissioner of Corrections, that the victims don't get a say in, well, how's he doing in anger management? classes or how's he doing in DV classes or sex offender treatment classes, they, they don't get a say in that. What they do get a say in a, in a voice in is their own fears and, and how they, uh, and part of this, the goal really of the, of, from my perspective was to at least give the victim some notice that this person is being released so that they can be prepared for it. Um, and that, that's not even available right now in the current law. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any problem with the notice. Yeah, and that's, that's what the intent was. Yeah. And whether it, you know, in the, in the way that it comes across, I can understand your point. We can work on the language, but it's not my intent to give the victim a voice any more than we give the victim a voice in sex offender treatment. Okay. Yeah. 
Do we have any sense of how, I mean, Joe asked about beds, but do we have any sense of how many people at any given time are in this category? Is it three or 23 or? I, sitting here right now, don't have that sense, but we will try to get you. Okay, I, I would like to, because I, mean, I think that. If you're in Chittenden County and what's happened in other cases around the state is, leads me to believe there's more than that. The more than four. Yeah, I just, I, I mean, it, it has some, whatever we think a number might be, it has Again, some bearing I, on I what know. the uh, available facilities are and how we. Absolutely. We, so, yeah. okay. Are there other questions of David? Pepper, do you have a comment? We will get to you someday. <laughs> James Pepper, well, Department of State Attorney and Sheriff's. I, you know, I think that's actually a question directed at the department. Um, and I'm just curious, would you like to know the number of competency and insanity evaluations that have been done and then just limit it to the homicide and attempted homicide cases? Well, we're talking about here about um, a three-year potential commitment of people who have been deemed insane. So how many people is that that you would have to make some provisions yeah. for? Is it? So I think the question really is how many of these evaluations have been done for murder and attempted murder charges? Mm -hmm. How many have the psychiatrists come back and said this person yeah. is insane? Yeah. Well, I'd be interested in Joe's yeah. point about the victims of aggravated sexual assault. Yeah. Okay. How many big 12 cases are there out there? Okay. I, I'd be really be interested in that. We could, I don't think you necessarily want to go beyond that. I, I'll leave it to the state's attorney to have to explain to a victim of a misdemeanor of some kind why they well, don't have to say. But I think, it, you know, I think if you looked at the Big 12 offenses, it would be probably covers. Questions, David, but thank you. And um, thank you. what I intend to do is bring this up again. And anyone who wants to test it, we will start with Matt and let Pepper have his 15 minutes after Matt has an hour. <laughs> you can bring any witnesses you'd like with you. Oh, you want me to bring some? No. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Well, yes. Yeah. Well, when we take this like up again, okay. Matt needs an hour. Okay. Give him 45 minutes. <laughs> and if he goes over, we'll... You can talk to Matt. And then um, Pepper needs 15 minutes. So that would be the first hour of testimony. I don't know. What, I don't, we won't get to it next week, but the week after. Okay. And then anybody else who wants to testify with us. And in, in order to save our legislative council, um, if the testimony is going to be mainly on section one, um, no, I don't want to have Katie have to sit through everything. Oh. Maybe Eric can, if there's something comes up about the other section, we could have Eric. And that's one and two, mostly. One and two. Okay. So if, if you could let us know when you sign up to testify which sections you are interested in so we have the right ledge council here because they have a difficulty scheduling um, they have many committees to serve many masters too many house committees that's the problem that's the problem <laughs> i realized today i realized yesterday i was at a thing in manchester with kathleen james and cynthia browning and I had no idea how many caucuses the house had, the, there are. Oh, there are like 40 I mean, of them. Oh, I know. That's, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to, I don't know, the older generate, the older people's caucuses I Thursday know. at noon. I know. We have people coming up for the older caucus. Then we have tomorrow the tourism caucus and the climate solutions caucus. The women's caucus is very interested in, in other subjects. Then there's the there's uh, the river caucus. Three, the river caucus, and there's three That's or other us. four other ones. There, Claire and I were going to set up a the caucus to 
uh, eliminate caucuses or whatever we called it, and you, the meeting wasn't going to be set and you weren't required to show up because we think there are too many, there's just a proliferation of, every time an issue comes up, somebody creates a caucus around it. I agree. <coughs> Thank you. We're adjourned. What?